special thank you uh, for the opportunity just to be here today. I've been looking forward to it. Uh, most of the things I do at, as it relates to preaching begin with a picture. So I'm going to give you this picture here. I'm pretty sure that's, does that run up top as well? Beautiful. Yeah, that is the mixing bowl. That is the Kitchen Aid 6 quart 600 going for 599. If you are cooking, it'll come in 12 colors. That's the picture. What's the principle? I don't know if you've ever watched any of those cooking shows, but if you have, you're aware that they somehow accomplish in one hour what you as the viewer are quite sure took about 20 to get done. That's the picture, that's the principle. What's the relationship to preaching? I just want to say to this hour, welcome to the kitchen. If the first talk today was on a commitment to exposition and the second talk was the conviction in exposition, then this is the kitchen in which we are going to spend some time cooking up exposition. And if you don't want to cook, you better get out now because we are going to give this a spin. Are you ready? Are you ready? ready? All right. You got to imagine that you are now a pastor of a local church. Let's call it one of those revitalizing works. You uh, are now sitting there on a Tuesday morning because you took Monday off. You're walking across the church parking lot to your office. The parishioner who's always there, whether church is open or not, looks to you and says, Good morning, Pastor. What do you got on this week? To which you say, nothing out of the ordinary, some meetings, some appointments, but, but you know, we are beginning the new series in Exodus on Sunday, and I've been asked to speak to the minister's conference on Friday morning, a breakfast of about 50 pastors, to which she says, I'll be praying for you, pastor, and you then move in. Now you're at your desk. You've got your coffee in hand. You've arrived at 7.30 to make a good start on the day. You know that your first appointment isn't until 10.30. No time for Twitter feeds this morning, no blogs, no Facebook. Well, we got to see where Dever is today. Let's at least do his Twitter feed. <laughs> oh, gosh, he's kind of like God. He's everywhere. <laughs> he's even here. He's in Kansas City. He's wanting to know if I know of a good barbecue place for him. Anyway, you put him back down. You say, I got a state of the word. And all of a sudden, you sit there and say, well, I want to get myself going. What can I do for these men on Friday? You pull out the mixing bowl, which means you pull out what? Your Bible. Hopefully, you've got one here with you. I encourage you to take it out. You open it up. You offer a prayer up to God. Dear Lord. Give me a word to share for those 40 pastors on Friday morning to which you hear in your office, unbeknownst to any Southern Baptist ever, an audible word from heaven says 2 Timothy 2, 14 to 19. Give them a word about the pastor's words. So you begin to Look for 2 Timothy 2, 14 to 19, and we should hear even now the rustling of pages as though we were at Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, <laughs> D.C. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, we're going to prepare a meal from 2 Timothy 2. And one of you is now going to read to the other person verses 14 to 19. Give it a go at 7.30 in the morning on a Tuesday.
Now, because somebody was kind enough to put David Helm's expositional preaching book in your hands, you know better than to simply ask at the outset of the week, what am I going to say from this text? You also know that you don't ask, I've got to find a sermon from this text. You actually now are on Tuesday morning at 7.30 by yourself in the study, and you're asking this question, how has the author organize the material which will be my text that's basically the structure of the 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 bones of the text 2 14 to 19 and so now you look to the person next to you and you both are in the kitchen and you're simply trying to answer the question pen and paper in hand how has the author organized the material of this text or what is the literary structure of this text? And you ought to be able to show it with verse divisions and sections. Go for it. I'll give you about four or five minutes. You're cooking now. Let me break in just a moment because it is a cooking class and they always preload some of those little bowls with ingredients. And so you're quite aware, even before you did any of the work, that this part of the letter is about the pastor's words. That's going to be a dominant emphasis. We've just been mixing that there for you. You're also aware that he has a way of structuring in this letter that moves from things that either are imperatives or feel like imperatives as the lead edge of a new way to make an argument. So in chapter 1, verse 8, he talked about not being ashamed and sharing in sufferings. He bundled two active components and then began to speak. Or in verse 14, follow and guard. Those bundling of imperatives. Or in 2.1, he actually talked about entrusting and sharing. And then later, remembering and knowing. And so now, with that little stuff stirring in the midst of your little bowl... You can look back with your partner and think perhaps he's structuring his material here along the imperatival uh, force of one section to the next. Maybe that'll help you. I hope it would. Give it another couple minutes. How has the author organized this text?
I know that's some quick work for you, but that's the way they do it on the cooking shows. So who's got something? Anybody have a first provisional take on how this material is organized? Yeah, what do you got? All right. All right, so there's a break. He's seen initially something 14 to 18, and then he moves at the back end, putting 19 standing on its own. In sense, he's looking at a twofold kind of thing. Who else has got something? Let's bring some more clarity to this. This is what working in community will do. Anybody else have something slightly different in shape? Yep. Okay, so, so far he had 14 and then 15 and 16 on their own, 17, 18, 19. Notice two people have made contributions so far and they've both hung verse 19 out on their own. That's probably something pretty solid to go on. Does anyone else see verses 14 to 18 differently than we've seen it to this point? Perhaps verse 19 is a final structural movement that we don't yet know what it is. But so far, it's laying out that way. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay, so the insight here, whether we've even got our breaks right, is there are positive things he's to do concerning words and negative things he's to do, and what's the relationship of those as they relate to one another and how we work our way through. Anybody else? Yes, sir. All right, so you're putting 14 out on its own. If you keep 19 out on its own, that means you have something like 15 to 18 making up the middle. Now, you're just looking at the text. It's Tuesday morning, thank goodness. As I was looking at it this morning even, I began to think of it in these terms. And this is early in the week, so I'm not committed to this. But I'm thinking in 14 there are two words that Timothy is to give to them. Followed by, that would be remind and charge. But then it shifts. It's not what Timothy is to give to them. It's two more words that Paul asks Timothy to keep. Do your best and avoid. The avoid seems to get extra play in the text, doesn't it? I mean, there's an elongation of structural material, like a long element of the body of this text where the avoiding of 16 actually carries out with full implication all the way through 18. Verse 19, interestingly, What's unique about 19? Does anybody know just looking at it as at an editorial level? What's unique about 19? The quotation marks. There seems to be two quotations. I'm not quite sure what to make of that, but it does seem that there are two words that Timothy is to give to them. Two words that Paul is asking Timothy to keep concerning himself. And then there are two quotations 
that may play some role. Well, by this time, it's 9 o'clock. I've been at my office an hour and a half, and that appointment is racing in here now at 10.30, and, but I'm, I'm kind of got the juices flowing. I'm feeling maybe there's something here. This is kind of exciting. I might need Brian Davis's towel if I keep up this pace for a while. <laughs> All there in my lonesome. But I moved from just a very provisional structural work to something else that's necessary, and that's the work of context. Because now, by 9 a.m., I'm not going to give this sermon the full weight of the week, because this is the one I'm giving on Friday morning. I've still got all the next one to go after, but I've got two questions in my mind contextually. One at a literary level, who is them? Charge them, remind them, charge them. That's a literary contextual question. My little cheap bowl over here that's got a little mix on you, there's two antecedents to it, one in 2 2, one in 2 10. You're going to have to decide who is them. Well, why don't you read them? Tell the guy next to you. Make your decision who is them, and on what basis are you going to argue it? Go for it. You're moving from structure to context. All right, what do you got? Who, who are the two possible grammatical antecedents for them? Somebody give me one. From verse 10? The elect. So it just could be remind them, remind the church, remind, you know, the folk that are coming, remind those. Of, and what's 2-2? Two, two? The faithful men that you're training to teach others. Is there any clue in the verse itself, verse 14, that would help you make a provisional judgment on who them is? Yes, sir. The elders, why? On what basis? What, what's, your, what's your exegetical reasoning for that decision on a Tuesday morning? Because they're the teachers? Okay. Okay, and is there any clue in verse 14 that it might be referring to teachers rather than just Christians? Yes, sir. Okay, so there's an element where the hearers of these are actually impacted. So, again, it's early in the morning, but the possibility exists that the them is the, his guys. Two words, Timothy is to give to his guys. That's a possibility. But there's another contextual thing that arose from those two quotations. This is not literary context. This is biblical context. This is canonical context. Do those quotations appear from somewhere else in the Bible? If so, where and to what end would Paul insert them here? Talk to the person next to you. Do those quotations appear from somewhere else in the Bible? If so, where and to what end would he insert them here?
Anybody got it? Somebody give me a couple of possible references where he's actually borrowing from an Old Testament story. Number 16, 5. Yes, sir. Number 16, in particular, verse 5. And is there another one? Say it again. Nahum 1, 7. Okay, I'm not familiar with that one. Thank God it's Tuesday. Anyone else? Huh? Number 16, 26 is also there. Any other book? Isaiah 6. Isaiah is also a possible reference. Uh, let me share, make sure I've got the right uh, element here. Isaiah 26, 13. Possible. Let's all turn to number 16. What was going on in number 16 by way of an incident? Anybody remember? Korah's rebellion. Korah was a teacher in the church of Moses, and he had 250 other teachers with him. And what was the charge against Moses put forward by Korah in number 16? What didn't he like about the senior pastor? He set himself above everyone else. He was the only one who could do the word in that context. If I could find number 16, I might be okay. In fact, the charge is one of the priesthood of all believers because he actually indicates in number 16, verses 3 through 5, would somebody read that very loudly for us? There's the phrase, the Lord will show those who are his. In fact, looking over at verse 26, there's a possible allusion to the other quotation, depart from the tents of these wicked. Now, tell the guy next to you, why would Paul want Timothy to read that incident after telling him what to do with his own words? Don't tell me, tell, tell them. What's your guess? What's your guess? Someone over to the left. Anybody got a guess? What's the value add of that quotation for Timothy in the mind of Paul? Nothing from the left. All right, what about the middle? Pardon me? He is tying them together, but why does he want, to what end, what's the value add for Timothy to read that? That is what's happening. My question is why? Okay, so, but what is being, what understanding, let me put it this way. How is your understanding of 2 Timothy enhanced because of your work? in biblical context. Nothing new under the sun. We're getting closer. We're starting to turn the burner up, but do they have to be dealt with today? What actually happened in number 16? God dealt with it. What's the value add for Timothy? Don't worry about all these things. This is the answer to the brother who asked the question that Brian thought he had a bunch of unbelievers in his congregation. (laughs) 
There's the value add. Biblical context is not just to talk about other parts of the Bible. Biblical context has a value add here for Timothy to say, hey, look, as you handle your words, as you present yourself to God, as you avoid those, guess what? Don't feel like you've got to take everybody out in your church. You know why? God can do that too. So it's an encouragement. 19 is actually functioning by way of emotional, psychological, pastoral application. What about the other quote? Just turn real quickly to Isaiah 26, 13. I'm just going to show you this because it's cooking class and i got to do a little bit of work for you. But Isaiah 26, 13 reads, O Lord our God, other lords besides you have ruled over us, but your name alone we bring to remembrance. In other words, we are calling upon your name. I was uh, with a gentleman, uh, Ryan Bishop, a couple weeks ago. We were struggling in this text and trying to sort it out together. And one of the things he mentioned, which I thought was just a wonderful phrase, is that there's a contextual correspondence between Isaiah 26 and number 16. Here's the contextual correspondence. In Isaiah 26 to 28, in that section, Isaiah is confronting false teachers and those who follow them. You can see it right there at the beginning of verse 13. O Lord our God, other lords besides you have ruled over us. Or in 28 verse 14, therefore hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers, who rule this people in Jerusalem. So there are other people trying to have the way with God's people. Then what happens is not only is that there, but they are providing salvation to those who will stay with Isaiah and his faithful ministry. And so what, what actually ensues then, there are actually elements in here about a strong foundation. The Lord's foundation holds. Do you know what happens in Isaiah 26 or 28 verse 16? Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion so that cannot be moved. So what he's actually indicating here is he's pulled two texts from the Old Testament where God himself accomplishes his work on behalf of the minister who is faithful. Now you need a second towel. <laughs> because you're feeling good. But it's 1030, your appointment's here, you've got no more time, you thought you'd get back to this thing in the afternoon, you didn't, you had an elders meeting to prepare for, so Bet you me, you're coming in now on Wednesday morning, 7.30 a.m. What do you got today, pastor? I'm going back into that Friday talk for pastors. I'll be praying for you, and you're in. But now you're taking the work you've done in structure, words that Timothy is to give, words that Timothy is to keep, two words that are to encourage Timothy in his giving and his keeping. That's descriptive work. But now you're going to move from that three-point talk that's wedded to the organization of the material, and you know you've got to come up with an outline. You've got to go from that structure to a sermon. And while this is a description of the content, it is not, it is not, what you bring forward into the pulpit because as this is a description of content your preaching outline actually ought to be discerned from your context you're speaking to 40 pastors so tell the guy next to you what's your three-point outline for that talk it's now Wednesday morning you're moving from structure to sermon from organization to outline a description of content to a discernment of my context. What are your three points for that Friday morning talk? Tell the guy next to you.
All right? Anybody? Some of you are probably good at putting outlines together. What do you got? You got to now stand up Friday morning. You're not going to give this talk much more time. You've already given it six, seven hours. Because this is just a Friday morning thing to 40 guys. You got your big Sunday thing to do yet. What's your outline? A pastor's word, a pastor's work, a pastor's warrior. All right, that's, that'll work. Outlines, if it'll work, let it work. I mean, don't spend, you don't have to spend forever on it. That's not bad. Somebody else? Rightly await. I love that. That's capturing some, some of the stuff. So you get up in the thing on Friday morning. It's 8 a.m. They got their ham and cheese empanadas already in them. You take a look at them and you say, I just want to talk to you this morning about these three things. You open it up and you let it go. Well, by this time it's Wednesday at lunch. Phone call. Uh, Mark Devers on line one for you. Okay, what's up, Mark? Oh, now Mark wants to know another restaurant that we have in Kansas City. <laughs> Come back. Here's what a lot of pastors do. Right at that point, they go, man, I came to conclusion. I got one of my talks done this week. Guess what I'm doing the next of the afternoon? I'm checking out. I'll wait till Thursday to start that Sunday message. Okay, you can wait. But your sermon won't be as good. So now you're back in the office Wednesday at 1, and you said we were going to open a series in the book of Exodus. And so you turn to Exodus 1, and you do the process all over again. And in Exodus 1, though, is different than in 2 Timothy 2, because this is a narrative. And it's going to come out to you by the way of structure, according to perhaps something I'm going to call a plot arc. So I'm looking for my setting. I'm just trying to get the structure, the organization, the setting of my text. These are the names of the sons of Israel. And then he names them all. Those who had gone down into Egypt, 70 persons. Provisional, Wednesday afternoon, one, one to four, past sons of the promise. And then I look over there at verse 22, and I'm looking for the stasis or the new setting by the time my sermon is going to end. And while it opened with the past sons of the promise, it closes with a proclamation of death upon all future sons of Israel. I've been taught in literary analysis that a plot will have a conflict. I've been taught that the conflict will escalate. I've been taught that it will arrive at a climax. And now I'm looking to the person, you're looking to the person next to you, and you are asking yourself this question, what is the conflict in this text? And from what verse to what verse would that actually go? Spend a few minutes and see if you can work your way through to the movements of the text. And you know this, that in this chapter, that little verse on multiplying and growing exceedingly strong comes a number of times and always as a break before the new movement. Go for it. I'll give you three, four minutes. How is the material organized as a narrative?
Anybody see anything? This is why those cooking shows are unrealistic, isn't it? Anybody see anything? Any movements? The past sons are dead, but the narrator wants you to know what? But the people, nevertheless, are more numerous. But then a conflict emerges, not concerning the past sons that are dead, but the present sons that are more numerous. And the conflict is brought of in terms of the subjugation of a people under another people, where they are building store cities and basically, it's, it's an exercise in controlling the population of Israel under difficulty. So the conflict is that the present sons are in incredible difficulty. And that really goes from verse 8, let's just say through 14, it's called slavery. But there's an escalation of that conflict for the present sons at verse 15. It's not just that the present sons are in difficulty, but what happens? Anybody? There's an actual uh, an edict put forward to get to as many of these sons as is possible. So it moves from their life being difficult to the present sons have an escalating problem and that they're actually, some of them, spasmatically, if the midwives could get there, were under a sentence of death. The climactic moment in the story, though, is something about these midwives who rescue this entire moment and as a result, God deals well with them and the sons continue to multiply. So now it's Wednesday afternoon, you're going home and you're just mulling this over and you're coming back now on Thursday because Sunday's coming. And I know in the African American church we always love that Sunday's coming, but every preacher knows the weight of Sunday coming. And it's not always easy. But it's now Thursday, and you feel like your sermon is going to have four movements. Remember, you're in a revitalizing church situation where the promises now seem to almost be eclipsed and gone, but the difficulty is upon us. The difficulty is immense. Indeed, the whole line might be extinguished, but now, Thursday, it's fresh in your mind. You're still thinking these things through. You're not committed on a sermon outline or even something to say yet because you know that there's a big difference between getting into a pulpit and saying something for God as opposed to getting in the pulpit and saying something from God. And so you're letting this stuff soak, but you are asking yourself, how does my text anticipate the gospel. How does my text in the Old Testament anticipate the gospel? You're not asking where is Jesus in my text. You're asking how is my text uh, altered by its fulfillment in the gospel? And so now I want to talk to the person next to you. You're thinking of possible ways to move in this preparation time of your text on preaching Christ because you should try to do that every, every week. And now you're asking yourself, how might I preach Christ from what I know at this point on a Thursday? You're going to sit for four hours with this question, but in the next two minutes, why don't you come up with three or four options and tell the person next to you, here's a way, possible way, I don't know if I like it yet, but here's a way. Give me three or four ways, tell the person next to you. How would you preach Christ from this text? Go for it.
Okay, let's give it a shot. Just give me some options. Just make a list. How are you going to do, how are you going to preach Jesus from here? What? Say it again. Preservation. Preservation of hope. Okay, so that's kind of taking the, the thematic element that's present in this text as a hopeful thing that God is still working and then moving from that concept of hope to Jesus as our hope. Okay, somebody give me another idea. Because in my sermon prep, I might get six or seven ideas down. Say that again. Okay, Moses. Now, unfortunately, okay, so Moses is one way, and if you did that, what, what tool would, be you, would you be using to get to Christ? Right. So it would be kind of like typology. The problem is I decided to preach Exodus 1. Doggone it, I should have lengthened this message because he does get born in the next few verses. So if I, if, I didn't have, if I didn't have the luxury of importing Moses as a typological figure into the text, but I might wait for that next week or somewhere down the line, but I was confined to this text, there would be another, I would need some more ideas. So someone give me another idea. You can use Joseph as a typology because he's back there in verse 6. How I would do that yet, I don't know, but it's Thursday and I'm thinking. Give me another one. Midwives. Godly fear leads to salvation. So that could be a way in which you attach yourself to the work of God. Possible. Give me another one. Okay, I might work through enslavement. Anybody else? Give me another one. Okay, so maybe there's a New Testament text that actually controls me rather than a concept or a type. And there is a New Testament text, and you just mentioned the one that's where? Matthew 2. Fascinating, because Matthew 2 talks about Jesus going down into Egypt and then all the babies being persecuted from uh, Bethlehem and all of a sudden there's a textual connection that leads me to a typological connection but it's not the typology of Moses suddenly Jesus could be standing in chapter one typologically as Israel itself just as Israel was under the persecution of ungodly rulers under the death sentence of their son so too the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came, was under that persecution. In fact, Satan is going to chase him down all the way until he kills him because he wants to abolish the entire line. That is a much stronger exegetical link than merely some of the things I've been thinking of. But I don't come up with that at first. What you need to do is get six or seven ideas out, and some of these you're going to throw away. You're going to go, well, that was just remind me of preaching. This reminds me of preaching. This reminds me of preaching. But this one, I've actually got some exegetical basis for thinking that might be a possible way forward. Put differently then, this is the life of Jesus, preaching Jesus. Just got this from Mike Bullmore last week. I'm already stealing it from him. So let's, let's just do this down here. That's a B, and he gets credit. Bullmore. Doggone it, I hate giving him credit for that. But no, he's, he really did do this. Bullmore gets the copyright. Where on this plot line of Jesus, eternity past, first appearing, his life, his death, burial, resurrection, his ascension, his present reign, his second appearing, and I don't know how long you all think that is, but let me tell you right now, it's not going to be very long at all before you go from second appearing to consummation. That's a joke, some of you. <laughs> Could I still be a member of your church, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> to consummation, to eternity future. If I was using the Matthew 2 text to preach Jesus, what dimension or where 
within the ministry and life of Jesus are we actually functioning here? We're right down here. It's an it's a incarnational infancy. It's an infancy rec- recollection that's going to come into my sermon. But with the be fruitful and multiply, be fruitful and multiply, that actually is the impact of this text for the people, and that actually comes as a consequence of his ascension because then the book of Acts moves all of this material forward into what the church does in the midst of its difficulty. And so all of a sudden, I'm preaching Christ from here. I'm applying the gospel from here. And I'm able to do all of that in one message. What have we been trying to do? It's, it's good to have a commitment to biblical exposition. And we need a conviction for biblical exposition. And now, building on that, you have got to find your way into the kitchen and know how to start cooking up exposition. And what I'm arguing for is that there are tools for you that can help you, reading strategies that can help you move from text to sermon because you all have a text to preach this week. Imagine how lucky it is that somebody here has got that 2 Timothy text. (laughs) Anybody got that 2 Timothy text this week? Anybody going to have that text this week? (laughs) If you're going to go and preach, your role is to go from the text to today. What I'm trying to tell you is the safest way to do that, the safest way home, is the long way round. you got to go to them and then. you got to do the work of the structure. you got to see actually how the biblical context actually mattered them and then. You've got to go across this top line, theological reflection. You've got to meditate on its relationship to the death and resurrection of Christ. And then you've got to be able to do synthesis. You've got to be able to go from a description of content to a discernment of context, arrangement of your material, the application of your message, the makeup of your audience, the making of your argument. This last line is about another six hours. That was just a simple exercise today to tell you what is required of us when we hold the conviction. Put differently, this is going to take every hour of every week you can possibly carve out. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give ourselves to your word and to the welfare of our people, and we now pray that uh, we we would rightly handle That when we see you face to face, our Lord Jesus, uh, we wouldn't be ashamed given the work that we put in. In Jesus' name, amen.